loosen and bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings to us. I pray that you would be with each of my students. Help them to have a wonderful day today. Help them to um, just follow your instructions, Lord, with everything that they do. To be honoring and glorifying to you. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's take a look at our <clears throat> verse. What kind of rewards will we receive? Well, God will give us different crowns. So 1 Peter 5, 4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. In Espanol, 1 Pedro 5, 4, Y cuando aparezca el príncipe de los pastores, vosotros recibiréis la corona incorruptible de gloria. So don't forget, even though you have until the end of the parcial, it is best to try to say these every week so you don't have a ton that you're saying all at once. All right, let's check into your homework. So you need to complete Doctrine 8-9. Saeed, you need to present Doctrine 8-8. Albert, you need to prepare to present Doctrine 8-9. And then answer 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1-14 through 14 questions. This would be section 3, letter C, 9 through 13. Okay, let's check over the answers from the questions we answered yesterday. So number one, in this context, what does knowledge do and what does love do from chapter 8? Well, knowledge causes pride, but love encourages others and builds them up. What problem was there in eating things offered to idols? For a mature Christian, there was no problem, but if someone believed it was wrong and ate it anyway, it would be sin. What knowledge was lacking in some? Well, some people did not know that meat offered to idols was not affected because idols aren't real. They still felt like this meat had some sort of effect. It was still, um, you know, it was dedicated to something perverse and to something wrong, and so they felt like it would have some sort of effect, and Paul's saying, now, we know that it doesn't because idols aren't real. That's the reason it has no effect. Is there any harm in eating food offered to idols? No, there is not. How could your liberty be a stumbling block to another? Well, that person might feel pressure to do something they personally believe is wrong because they see you doing it. And if they were to go ahead and do it, even though their conscience tells them it's wrong, then they would be sinning. What violation of conscience is discussed in 1 Corinthians 8.10? Well, this one very much ties into the last question. A couple of these questions are basically asking the same thing because Paul is kind of, he kind of repeats himself a little bit because he's really trying to get the point across. So the violations for someone who believes something is wrong to do it anyway. How could we wound the weak conscience of another? This is the same idea of being a stumbling block to someone. Our actions could cause someone to do something they believe is wrong. Instead of harming a brother in Christ, what was Paul willing to do? He was willing to never even eat meat again. So that principle should be the same for us. We should be willing to give up something that's not wrong for us. It might even be fun, but could be considered wrong to somebody else. And so we should be willing to give it up so that they would feel comfortable. Okay. So our lesson today is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. We're talking about Paul's rights as an apostle. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll start with verses 1 through 2. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not my are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto you, others yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So here Paul is is trying to uh, first of all defend himself as an apostle. He's had many people who, who have doubted him and questioned him. From the very beginning of his, his ministry, of his service to God, people weren't sure whether or not to take him seriously. And so the fact that he calls himself an apostle, they're still not sure about. Because an apostle was someone who directly um, saw God, saw Jesus. And we know that he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. So that qualifies him to be an apostle. And 
um, he tells them that they're his spiritual children. They have been established, their church have been established through his preaching. So they were, so they themselves, the Corinthians, were a proof of his apostleship because he had established their own church. They could not deny his apostleship without denying their own salvation, without because they had trusted what he said, had believed what he said, and through that had made the choice to become Christians. So if he was a false teacher, then they would be saying that what they believed was false. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Jesus? For I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? So what's he talking about here? Well, when he, wherever he says, have we not power, that's kind of like, aren't we able to? Don't, don't we have the ability to do this? So, Paul, so Paul's defense to those who question his right for living for claiming to be an apostle, he explains that, um, first of all, he his um, living should freely come from the people that they are ministering to. It should be um, something that they are willing to do. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Aren't we able to eat and drink and, and to be supported? Then uh, he explains that the women who traveled with him were there to help minister just like the women who ministered with Jesus. So he's saying, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So the, are, aren't we able to have women come with us to help support us, to help us with, um, with the, the job of serving the Lord, as well as other apostles, their wives? Uh, when he talks about Cephas, that's referring to Peter. We know that Peter was married, and so perhaps his wife sometimes came along with him to help him minister, to help to help him as he served the Lord in starting churches. So he's saying we have the right to have people come with us and to, to help us as we do. And then he says, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. So Paul and Barnabas had every right to receive funds for their ministering, to receive money for doing what, um, for doing the work of the Lord. But only of a few churches or individuals did this. Mostly they provided for themselves. They were, uh, they voluntarily provided for themselves. They didn't ask for people to provide for them because they viewed it as a joy just to serve God. And so he was happy to, to work for himself in that way. But he's saying we do have a right to ask for support from you. Right, continuing with his defense, verses 7 through 10. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sake? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So again, Paul is addressing the, um, the, the aspect of receiving money, receiving support for your ministry. In verse 7, Paul shows that it is ridiculous for someone not to receive support from those they are ministering to. Their job is to serve the Lord. He provides their salary through those people. This was something that started way back when. In verse 8, um, he kind of shows where this starts. He says, say I these things of a man. So is it just me saying this? No, this comes from the very law. It was written in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the oxen that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? So he's, he's kind of sarcastically saying, is God just talking about oxen or is God talking about people? No, he's talking about people. Remember that the law of Moses set the precedent by providing for the priests through the gifts that were brought to the temple. They, the priests were able to take of these gifts and they, they were able to um, have their food from the things that were brought through the temple. So in verse 9, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, when he says, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the oxen that treadeth out the corn. If you muzzle the mouth of an ox, 
that means that he can't reach down and eat as he's plowing. But if you leave it unmuzzled, that means that his, his mouth is uncovered and he can eat while he works. The idea is that you would allow the ox to eat while he works so he has enough strength to continue working. So God uses this as a principle for man. Man should be able to enjoy the fruits of his labor. When he works, he should be he should receive compensation for his work, be able to eat to provide for himself. So it's not unreasonable for a minister of God to expect to be supported so that he can live. Not expecting or, or wanting to get wealthy. He's not looking for a lot of money or anything, just enough to, to live, to support oneself. Okay, keep going. This is 11 through 14. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So the people didn't seem to want to give Paul any financial support for his ministry, so that's why he has to keep defending himself and he is, keeps kind of driving the point home for them. He points out that just as God says that you reap what you sow, they had sown spiritual things, which were of much more value than the carnal things they were asked to gain to reap. So they, he says, we have sown spiritual things. They had, they had given them the gospel. That affects their eternity. They would be able to spend eternity in heaven now because they had preached the gospel to them. So they had sown something of great value. They were reaping, asking to receive something that's something that doesn't even have that much value. Money in order to live. That's something that's just here on this earth. It's not wrong for them to ask for it because you need it in order to live. And the people didn't seem to want to do it. But he's saying, listen, we're asking for something that's not that, that is of far less value than what we have given you. Paul had every right to ask for a living from them. He didn't because he didn't need it personally. He provided for himself. So he didn't want them to think that that's why he ministered to them. That's why he would provide for himself. He didn't want people to think that he was just in ministry in order to get rich, to get money. He did want to teach them, though, the principle of support because others coming after him might need it. People, um, people who would follow in Paul's footsteps, who would continue to minister to the churches, they might not have the same opportunities that Paul had of their own money, and so they might need the support. So these churches needed to kind of soften up and be willing to give that support uh, for the next person who came along. Paul was willing to endure difficulties making his own way so as not to be counted among the false teachers who always sought money. But he wants to point out that even those uh, even the priests in the temple and from when God set it up, they received gifts for working at the temple. They received their support. So the Corinthians should be more than happy to support those who are doing what's right and serving God. They, they aren't able to have their own other job. A person in full-time ministry can't dedicate themselves to another job. Their job is to serve the Lord in full-time ministry. So those who are being ministered to, the church... They should be the ones to provide their salary, to provide their living. They're not in it to get rich. They're just in it. They, they just need enough to survive. So the, what we can gain from this is that if you, are, uh, if you know someone who is serving the Lord, then you should be willing to help support them. That's what a church does. A church has missionaries that they support. I am a missionary here in Roatan. I don't receive any money for being a teacher here, Mr. Mark does not pay me. I receive money from other people in the States who support me for, for serving the Lord here in Honduras because I don't have a, a regular job in the States that would get money. The only way for me to live is for other people to support me. So you should be willing to give your money in offerings and things like that that's going to go to support the work of God, the ministry of God. If you are someone who is looking to go into full-time ministry, maybe you feel like God's called you to be a missionary or a pastor, then you have to understand that 
you're not going to be living a life of a rich person. You're going to be living off of the support of other people for you. But that should be your joy to do in order to serve God. Okay. I hope that you guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you in our next lesson. Bye.